All right, you can grab a seat. Uh, so if you've, uh, I, I hope that you've had a chance to meet my wife, Erica. I think she's pretty much the best ever. Um, there are a few, yeah, you, you can clap, you can celebrate that. <laughs> celebrate that. Somebody, uh, somebody grab that clip from YouTube and just email it to her right now. Say, look, they clapped for you. It was awesome. Uh, in agreement, yeah. Uh, there are a few areas, though, where she and I have a few disagreements. And one of those areas would be regarding the frequency with which walls need to be repainted. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out how the paint wore out so fast that it has to be replaced, but she wants it replaced, right? And so, um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I admit, now I'm, I'm joking uh, some, but I'm also admitting my own weaknesses and failures here. So when we moved to Ridgefield eight years ago, I was excited to be able to buy a house that was the newest house we had ever owned. Therefore, I concluded needed the least amount of work that any of our four homes we have owned in, the, in our, over our marriage would need because we have painted a lot of walls. We've, re, we've replaced a lot of roofs. We've fixed a lot of basements. We've fixed everything in every house we've had. And so I was just kind of done with that whole phase of needing to always be fixing and repairing things. And so when we bought our house and it had been freshly repainted and I was like, it is move in ready. It doesn't need anything. Now I know we got to hang the pictures because that's how you make a house into a home. But beyond hanging pictures, like we're not replacing carpet, we're not replacing the floors and the walls are, they, it came pre-painted. It was wonderful. <laughs> And then she's like, you know, the front game room, that would look a lot better if that ugly blue was a different blue. And I, I had a bad attitude. And I was like, well, then you're painting it. <laughs> and it was hard sitting in the living room watching TV <laughs> while she and Olivia were painting. I mean, there was a lot of guilt flowing, right? <laughs> but I got over it and finished my movie. <laughs> And I have to admit that, I have to admit that the front office, I mean, the front room, it looks really, really great. And the new blue does look a lot better than the old blue. So then when she's like, I think we need to repaint the bedroom. I was like, okay, still don't think it's worn out, but I'll trust you a little bit more on this one. So I helped, but I still, man, struggled, struggled through that. And so we're painting. We've got our painting down. Like I said, we painted lots and lots of walls, right? I cut in, she rolls, we're fast, we get it done. We spill very little on the carpet. Everybody's happy and we have a fun, a fun you know, time working together. And we don't even argue too much. It's just, we've, we've got our system down. But I have to tell you, while I'm cutting in all along the wall in the, be in the, in the, in the bedroom, I'm telling myself a story. And the story goes something like this. I shouldn't have to be spending my day doing this because these walls don't really need to be painted. And if we just really, and I, and I the, the story going through my mind is not a pretty story, I hate to admit. But that's kind of what we do, isn't it? And if you were honest, and if you got to be up here today, you would get the opportunity to tell a time and an opportunity where you, maybe your spouse, maybe at work, maybe somebody else, that you were telling yourself a story that kept running through your mind that wasn't the best story. It wasn't a helpful story. You fully believed it to be a true story, but we just let the stories and the st run through our mind and the stories we tell ourselves shape how we feel, how we act, how we, what we believe, how we treat other people. And... Well, that's what we find in Scripture as well. So we don't really like the negative stories that we probably shouldn't be telling ourselves, but that is kind of the human condition. And what we find, and we're going to see it today as we've been lock, walking through the Gospel of Luke, is Jesus wants to help his disciples, and you and I, disciples in 2024, uh, to tell ourselves a better version of the story that's not going to end up with us let down, disappointed, or how about angry and bitter? When the stories we've been telling ourselves don't come true and they don't happen, and then it's God's fault. But I think what Jesus wants us to learn is maybe it's not God's fault when the stories we've been telling ourselves don't come to fruition. Maybe it's that we were telling ourselves a different story, not the story that Jesus had for us. 
So here we go. Luke chapter 9 is where we're at if you want to follow along. We've been spending a few weeks kind of in Luke chapter 9. Um, Miranda got us started a few weeks ago. And uh, in, in, uh, with, with one of these greatest, um, one, one of the, the key stories uh, in the gospel of Luke, well in all the gospels, Luke chapter 9 verse 20, um, Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? And he's really trying to get um, a, a nail down this sense of identity and who is Jesus? Who do you believe Jesus to be? And they say, well, you know, Elijah, one of the prophets, John the Baptist, come back from the dead. And then he says, what about you guys, though? Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up, inspired by God, speaking through him, and he says, you are God's Messiah. In other gospels, he'll say, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, right answer, Peter. For the first time in your life, when you've blurted something else, you actually got it right. Right answer, I am God's Messiah. And now I'm going to teach you what that means. Because they had a story that they had been telling themselves about God's Messiah all along. They had been hoping that Jesus might be the God's Messiah. Every Jewish man and woman living in the, the, the modern day state of Israel at that time, they, they were all looking for God's Messiah. Because the story of God's Messiah, the story that they were telling themselves, went something like this. When God sends the Messiah, the Messiah will be a savior, mostly a political savior, and he will bring new political leadership and will bring a season of freedom and economic opportunity like we have not seen and that we've only heard about in the stories of our ancestors, and it is going to be wonderful. And if we, who recognized the Messiah early on, and we got in good with him, we were his early followers, we're going to get to be the lieutenants in his army. We're going to get to have cabinet positions in his administration. We're going to finally live the good life that we've been wanting to, and all for the glory of God that conveniently benefits us as well. That was the story they were telling themselves. And now, when Jesus says, right answer, it seems like he's going to affirm the story that they've been telling themselves. And Jesus says, wait, hold on. I want to correct the story that you've been telling yourselves, and I want you to tell yourselves and begin to believe a new and a better story. And here it is right here, verse 21. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Even though it was true, he's like, hold on, because, because first of all, I've got to start with you guys telling you a new story and convince you of a different story here. Verse, 20, verse 22. And so he said, the Son of Man, speaking to himself, speaking about himself here. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. He says, yes, I'm the Messiah, but here's the rest of that story. And he begins to tell them the story of a suffering Messiah, which was not in any of the chapters of their Messiah stories that they remember. But actually, when you look back at Isaiah chapter 52, 53, he says, actually, the story of a suffering servant, a suffering Messiah, a leader who's more of a servant than a power monger, who serves people and washes people's feet rather than beats them down, like, that, that, that story's actually there, but conveniently, you've just kind of missed it. And he says, guys, I want you to begin to think about the story of God's Savior who came from heaven and the plan was to suffer. The plan was to die. The plan was to rescue people. The plan all along was to give his life. 
And as you can imagine, with a very political version of what God's going to do, if that's the only story they had, no political leader who is going to be a superstar hero and lead us into the future, they don't die in the first battle. They live. They make other people die and make their enemies die. And so Jesus, really, as you, can under, as you can just imagine, he is going to have to work hard at getting these guys and really all of us to believe a different kind of a story. Because often we will tell ourselves stories like, I shouldn't be have to do this. I should not have to be doing this right now. I should be able to do that over there that's a lot more fun, a lot more engaging what I want to do. I, shouldn't be ha I should not have to do this right now. And so he tells them a story of themselves. He says, if you want to be my disciple, that looks like denying yourselves. That looks like taking up your cross every day. And you follow me wherever I lead you. And I've already told you where I'm headed is a hill with a cross and a lot of suffering. He says, let me tell you the story of chasing wealth and fame and power and honor. It leads to compromising and losing your soul. That's the real story of chasing power, wealth, and fame. And so I remember sharing with someone one time that if you give your life to Jesus, he'll make your life better. And a long-time follower of Jesus overheard me say that, and he said, you know what, you should stop telling people that. Because that's kind of over-promising too much. If you give your life to Jesus, he'll make your life better. Quite often, when you give your life to Jesus and start following Jesus, in a lot of ways, life becomes harder. I said, yes. But I didn't say that if you give your life to Jesus, he'll make your life easier. Or if you give your life to Jesus, life will be easy. What I said was, if you give your life to Jesus and you start following Jesus, he'll make your life better. Because there is a difference between better and easier. Or is there? You see, again, the stories that we tell ourselves is that the easy life is the good life. And that if life is going to be better, then it should be easier. And if life is harder, that's not necessarily better. But that's not Jesus. That's the story that you bought into and that I bought into at some point. And so maybe it's not, maybe it's not the story of Jesus we're struggling with. It's the story that we have chosen to believe for ourselves. And I think that's what Jesus wants us to deal with. And that's what we're going to look through. And that's what we're going to deal with really in the next section of the Gospel of Luke. You see, we've been walking through for a couple of months now the Gospel of Luke. And as Luke tells the story, we've been noticing all of these instances and these characters, these desperate souls who have been overlooked and marginalized. They've been, they've been cursed. They've been cast out of society. Nobody wanted anything to do with them. And they thought that they were on the outside of God's favor and that God wouldn't have anything to do with them. And consistently, chapter after chapter after chapter, every episode, what do these desperate souls experience when they come into contact with Jesus? They experience the embrace of God. They experience a God who not only embraces them, but looks for them and pursues them and says, God knows you, God cares about you, and God has plans for your life like you've never imagined. That those who are sick and disabled, that Jesus heals them and strengthens their body. The ones whose minds and souls were tortured as, as if they were chained and held back, they are set free. And they go from desperate to growing and embraced, and that's the story we've been seeing. And here's what Jesus now begins to teach. That is that sitting in the embrace of God is not all there is to the story of following Jesus. This, this, this vision of Jesus and what God has for us that is very affirming, that is very loving, that is very accepting, it is all true. And Jesus says there's more to the story than just getting 
good stuff from God. A couple of weeks ago, I, I shared with you the, the, the pattern we see of Jesus several times over. So he, he finds Peter, the fisherman, who is this desperate soul himself. He finds Peter, he welcomes him, welcomes him, he invites him to follow him, he builds him up, and then he sends Peter and the other, of the other 11 of the 12, he sends them out to do his work. And that's kind of Jesus' pattern, is he finds people, he brings them in, or at least brings them together, he builds them up, and then he sends them out. And he finds another group, and he just continues this process. That's the process that Jesus kind of works time and time and time again with people and with groups, but also in the overall ministry of Jesus. It's what Jesus does. So for the kind of first eight, nine chapters of the Gospel of Luke, we see Jesus bringing people together, bringing people together, bringing people together. Now Jesus says, we're going to move on to the next step of your training to be one of my followers. And the next part of the story the next part two of the book of following Jesus and the story of following Jesus and what is it like to still follow Jesus, the story I want you to begin to tell yourselves is, well, it may not always feel good. It might be hard. It might not always feel like an embrace. It might not always feel like the affirmation that you're hoping for, that there will be challenge. It'll be hard. This is the... This is the this is the workout part of the story of following Jesus. And over the next several chapters, and no, we are not going to take the next several months to teach the downer, hard, miserable part of following Jesus, because even though it's hard, doesn't mean it's bad. Even though it's hard, doesn't mean it's a downer and a negative. This is the story of Jesus. In fact, the way we're going to focus on it and we're going to look at it is that when Jesus teaches us how to do hard things, even when he has hard truth for us, what Jesus does is he builds up in us a kind of personal resilience that makes us able to face hard things and not wilt, fall back, fail. But Jesus says in order to do that, you've got to begin to tell yourself the rest of the story, a better story than just the story of Jesus loves me, therefore it's easy. Jesus loves me, that's all there is to the story. He says there is more to the story, let's add on to the story. And so chapter 9 really is a transition chapter. And everything that we see in chapter 9 is, in, is really kind of helping to transition the story to the next part of what Jesus wants them to learn. And so, 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 uh, Peter says, you're the Messiah. Jesus predicts his death. And then we get the transfiguration. Billy preached on that last week. This moment in which God affirms to his disciples, at least Peter, James, and John, the three of them, like, this is my son. You should listen to him. It's very clear. It is the son, he is the son of God, connects the Old Testament back to the present of what they're doing. And he really wants them to know and be like, you know who he is. He is the son of God. Now, take courage to take your next difficult steps. They come back. We read here that Jesus heals a boy who's possessed by a demon. And then look at this in verse 44, the second half of verse 44. While Jesus was marveling, while, while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man, speaking about himself here, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they didn't understand what it meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, <clears throat> and they were afraid to ask him about it. So rather, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child, had him stand beside him. And then he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who's the greatest. See what Jesus is trying to do? He's trying to teach them the full story. Because they're still telling themselves this incomplete story. This story of, I shouldn't have to suffer. If I'm following Jesus, it's going to be good. Who's going to be the greatest? I don't know, Thaddeus. I, sometimes, Thaddeus, you kind of get in the way and you make bad decisions. I think I'm going to be, you know, and so, you know, Thaddeus and Thomas, they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest, right? Because they're imagining, they're imagining Jesus on this throne in his kingdom. 
And not like up in heaven, but like here on earth. And he's got a palace, and there's Jesus, and he's in the center, right? And I don't know if you've ever seen like the, the big throne with the tallest back. And then right next to it, on the right and left, there's like mini thrones. And the backs of the seats, they're just a little bit shorter than the one in the middle. And then the ones out from that, because every, everything's nice and neat and symmetrical, they're a little bit shorter, right? And you go down, and that guy, he gets a stool. But at least he gets to be on the stage a little bit in proximity to the king, but the guy with the stool definitely is not as great as the guy with the second high back to his chair. Isn't it funny the amazing things we humans use to like feel good about ourselves? How high is the back on your chair? Whatever. We're, that's the story we tell ourselves, right? And Jesus says, guys, <clears throat> you didn't get it, and you were afraid to ask me about it. Because you're kind of afraid of this story that I'm trying to tell you. That I am going to be arrested and killed. By the way, it's going to be for your benefit. Because those sins you've got, we've got to deal with that. You've been, trying to, you've been trying to get into God and make up for those sins your whole life. And it's not really working too well. So I'm going to give my life for you as this perfect, complete sacrifice. All the sacrifices you've seen at the the temple. They're all an object lesson so that when people see me hanging on a cross, they're going to recognize me as the perfect, final, once and for all sacrifice. So guys, the story is, I am the Messiah. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer and die. That's the next part of the story. And they're like, but Jesus, I thought following you was going to make my life better. And he's like, oh, it will but it won't make your life easier. It doesn't mean it'll be pain-free. But I'm going to teach you to do hard things as I take the lead. My job is to die for the sins of the world. Your job is not to die for the sins of the world. Your job is to die to your ego that loves attention. Die to your desire to get attention, to get likes, to get your own followers. Die to your demand that you live a comfortable life. Die to the never-ending comparison of how you measure up to the people around you and how big the back of your chair is or how big the size of your house is or which neighborhood you live in or which suburb you oh man Jesus you're getting at us now so Jesus pulls up a, a little boy and he says the story you've been telling yourself is that this little child is at the bottom of the social ladder of greatness and so you just ignore him, overlook him. But in my kingdom, the story I want you to tell yourself is a story of kneeling, getting down on his level, and loving and giving the child more attention than you give to the person who has something to offer you, position, fame. That's the story I want you to tell yourself in my kingdom. That's the better story. Is following Jesus, discipleship, if you will, includes doing hard things. Now look at verse 51. This is, just let me just nerd out here a little bit, a little bit of Bible study nerd. When you're reading the Gospel of Luke, this is probably one of the most important verses in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, you know, the, the, the big books that I have on my shelf, we call them commentaries, Bible scholars who comment and help us to better understand the text, right? One of them, I just noticed today that he has like three volumes, like volume two starts at verse 51. I was like, I want to get a little bit of, and I don't have volume two of this guy. And so I was like, oh man, I can't see what he said because he ended volume one at the end of verse 50 because he recognizes this is a transitional verse. Okay, we're, we're done nerding out. Here, here's a go. Look at what it says here. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. 
That's a mouthful, intentionally. Because Luke is like, something happened that day. And all the followers of Jesus, they remember it. Jesus probably got a little quiet. And his breathing was a little labored because he knew what the future meant. Because although he knew his story was to die, it's not like he was looking forward to it. He didn't enjoy the suffering. Oh, he was willing to give his life because he loves you and I so much. But he didn't want to go through with the pain that it would be required. But, but he looks down the road and the sign says Jerusalem that way. And he says, okay, guys, we've been in and around Jerusalem a couple of times. We've run down there for a couple of errands. But like, here we go. We're going to Jerusalem. And everything changes starting today. We've closed book one. Now we're in book two. And I've tried to tell you twice what's going to happen. You haven't understand it. But here we go. And here we go. Verse 52. And so he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. Jesus is coming. He's making his way to Jerusalem. You don't want to miss out. This might be the last time he comes through your village. But the people there, they didn't welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. There were some political, cultural, racial things going on. They're like, if all you're doing is moving through town, you're just walking through. We don't want you. And they miss out. And when the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down the fire from heaven to destroy them? He's like, oh, you guys. Jesus turned and he rebuked them. And so then he and his disciples went to another village. See, he's trying to like, again, trying to get them to tell themselves a better version of the story. He's like, you guys, we're not going to Jerusalem to burn it down. Give it a couple decades, the Romans will do that. They'll take care of that, right? Like, that's not my job. My mission is not to go burn down cities. My job is to go give my life. My job is we're still going to find people who are desperate. We're still going to embrace them. We're going to invite them along the journey. Like, come on, guys, what have I taught you? He's trying to get them to tell themselves a better version of the story. And so as they were walking along, verse 57... A man said to him, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now remember, this probably happened several times. But as Luke, like he really remembers, like, remember what I just said? We are headed towards Jerusalem. Here's what's coming. Guy comes, I'll follow you wherever you go. You're a rabbi. I, like to, I want to follow. You're a good rabbi. I want to learn from you, Jesus, wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man, I have no place to lay my head. There's nowhere in Jerusalem that's waiting for me with open arms and a comfortable bed to sleep in and a nice, wonderful hot meal to eat. We don't know where we're going to sleep. One of the commentators that I read said, Jesus is quite possibly saying here, I, I know you see me as a rabbi, but I'm more like a prophet. And prophets aren't always welcomed because sometimes they bring some bad news that's not easy to hear. So if you really want to follow me, this isn't the comfortable life of a traditional rabbi. You might not have a place to live. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. Which doesn't really make sense at all. But you go proclaim the kingdom of God. Okay, why would Jesus say something that is so harsh? Because possibly the man was saying, Jesus, I'd love to follow you. But my father's still alive. And there were cases of this where folks would say, I I'd like to do this, but I do need to honor my father. My father's still alive. So when he passes away and I'm able to settle his estate and things are fine and I don't insult my father by leaving my father to follow the rabbi, then I will follow you. And there were cases of this, but it turned out the man's father was 40 some years old. And it would still be decades before the man would really get around to following Jesus. And Jesus says... If you want to follow me, there is a price to pay. That is part of the story. 
it is hard. There are old customs that are going to be broken and people who will feel insulted because you're following me, Jesus says. And you go proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another person, verse 61, said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And again, when we read it, it wasn't like Jesus saying, no, we can't wait three minutes. We have to get ourselves to Jerusalem. Because it's actually going to take a long time for Jesus to get to Jerusalem. So Jesus is more making a point here than saying, no, you can't run back real quick. But, but he says, listen, listen. What do you mean by run back and tell your family goodbye? Is this going to take three minutes or three years? Because you're, you're kind of, can't decide who you want to honor. Your family or Jesus or who you really wanted, what your priorities are. And Jesus says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. These don't really feel like embracing kind of statements, do they? But they're coming from the same Jesus who is the, still the Son of God. Whether he's healing a blind person or he is calling his followers to decide Could it be that what these three folks have in common is they're saying, okay, Jesus, as soon as it gets easier and life settles down, then I'll have time to follow you. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, I've been there, done that. And life never slowed down, life never settled down, and the time never came, and I missed my chance. And Jesus says, just like the guy who's trying to plow his field, if he's always looking back to see what he left behind, his field's going to be a mess. Like, you can't plow in a straight line if you're looking back. You've got to look ahead. And so Jesus says, guys, I want you to start telling yourself the rest of the story. And that is that following me, what we call discipleship, being a disciple of Jesus, includes hard things. Because life includes doing hard things. And following Jesus is not a way to just get away from doing hard things in life. Life includes hard things. But you know why this is good news? Because all along, Jesus shows them himself how to do hard things. Jesus doesn't send them to do anything he hasn't already done. Jesus doesn't tell them to say things that he hasn't already said. Jesus models it for them. Jesus goes ahead and Jesus shows them and us. In 2024, on the other side of the world, how to do hard things. So, how about you? What's the hard thing that you're facing right now? Maybe it's a cancer diagnosis. And your mind is spinning out of control with a story and you're trying not to tell yourself that story of pain and the, that has a really bad ending and you're facing the hard thing. And Jesus says, I, I know you're facing a hard thing, but I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to strengthen you and enable you to do this hard thing. Maybe you're facing an unexpected, unplanned for mid-career job change. And you have never felt so insecure in your life. And Jesus says, the story I tell you, the story I want you to tell yourself is, Jesus helps you do hard things. Two weekends ago, we were in Nampa, Idaho, dropped our oldest child, daughter Olivia, off at college. Whew, talk about doing a hard thing, man. We had kind of some orientation sessions, and one of the orientation sessions, they had all the parents together, and they said, this is, this is the time just for the parents and not for the students. And the president of the college talked to us, and he said, uh, 
He said, you know, I, I, I look back and I remember when we dropped each of our three boys off at the university. And well, later on, um, I, I, we talked to our boys and discovered that all three of our boys remember exactly what I said to them before we left. And so he looked at all of his parents and he said, here in a little bit, in a couple of hours, you're going to have an opportunity with your child. And you're, what you say to them, they will most likely remember for a long time. So choose your words carefully. I'm like, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> Talk about pressure. So I began to think, okay, what, what is it? And I, and I realized whatever I, need, whatever I say needs to be what she needs to hear, not what I want to say. And so this needs to be much more about her and not very much about me because there's a lot of me going on here, but it's not her job to bear my own thoughts and stress. It's not her to worry about how much I'm going to miss her and how sad I'm going to be. So that's not what we're going to leave her with because I need to tell her what she needs to hear, not what I feel like saying. And so I thought, what does she need to hear? And I landed on two things. Number one, I believe in you. I believe you have what it takes The second one, you're not alone. Because what was hard about this was there was nobody else that she knows on campus. And the feeling and the story she might tell herself is, I'm here all by myself. I don't know anyone. I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone. And the truth is you are not alone. You're going to make friends. You're going to make more friends. And there is a God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he is here, and he goes ahead of you, behind you, and all around you. You are not alone. And I think that is what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand is, look, I'm going to call you to do some crazy things. You need to know they're going to be hard. But as you're following me, you're just following me into that hard thing. You're not going there alone. Because you're not going there alone. You're not going there fully on your own strength. That you have the full force, authority, and power of God with you and the Holy Spirit in you. You're not alone. And so Jesus, he leads them into this hard time. And that is lesson number one of how to do hard things is that when you're doing hard things, as you're following Jesus, you're not doing hard things alone. So what about you? The hard thing that you're facing, what would it look like to imagine yourself walking into that treatment facility, not alone? Walking into that job interview, not feeling very self-assured, but knowing that you are not alone. Walking away from security and what you know into the unknown, but knowing you are not alone. In fact, why don't we bow our heads, pray together, Mike's going to come back. We're going to sing one more song. But before we sing, let's, let's just do this, though. I want you just to imagine yourself and the hard thing that you're facing. And I want you to ask yourself, what's the story that you've been telling yourself about how hard, bad, and awful this is going to be? And in the story that you've been telling yourself, is Jesus a character who's active in that story or have you accidentally left him out of the story? And what would it look like to write Jesus into his rightful place in your story? That you're going to do something hard and it is unknown. And you could focus on the story and the parts that are scary. Or you can focus on the parts of the story where Jesus is right there with you. Just take a moment. Imagine it. See yourself walking hand in hand with Jesus into that hard thing. Oh, Jesus, I pray today. I pray today that you would tell us the story you want us to tell ourselves.
Jesus, would you tell us the better story, the best story? See, the gospel, the gospel is not just a story about what happens after you die. The gospel is a story of what happens starting today until you die and then beyond. Eternal life starts now. The Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of you starting today, right now. Your sins are forgiven now and you live a new life starting now. That's the good news of Jesus. And by the way, the story of Jesus is... It didn't end on the cross. It, had to, it's, it, 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 it stopped off for a little while at a cross, but it ends at an empty tomb with a resurrection and a Jesus who can die no more. That's the end of the story. But too often we miss out on the resurrection because we avoid the crucifixion. Too often we miss out on all the great things God could do in and through us because we refuse to carry our cross daily. That's hard. In fact, maybe for someone today in this room, the decision you make, or maybe you're watching online, the decision to make is like, okay, I've been, I've been, I've been curious about faith and curious about following Jesus, and I've been sensing Jesus saying, come follow me. And today's the day to step across the line of faith and trust Jesus. If that's you, as we're praying today, you just pray a prayer that goes something like this. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Make me yours. And empower me to follow you for the rest of my life. It begins with a prayer like that. And then you go tell someone. But today I trusted Jesus. And if this is you today, I'd love for you to find me after the service and tell me I trusted Jesus today. I took the hand of Jesus and I'm not looking back. Come on, church, let's stand together today. I do, I was not planning for a prayer team time today, but I'm just kind of sensing that it is appropriate. So maybe Javier and Kay, could you guys join us up here? And then... Um, and then if there's more folks who want to pray, I'll step up. And anybody else, you can be a prayer team member as well. But if you're looking at something hard, you're looking at facing a hard thing and you're just not sure how it's going to go, let one of these prayer team members pray with you today and pray God's Holy Spirit around you, His strength to fill you. Let's, let's follow Jesus into all the hard things that He has for us today. Mike's going to lead us. We're going to sing about how the goodness of God and God has been so faithful in our lives. This is a word that says, I can, I know that I can walk into the future God has for me because I know that God is going to be faithful and good in my life. Amen? So church, let's seek him today. Let's, let's surrender our lives to him. Kay's available to prayer. I'll stand down here. Maybe Leon, if there's someone else, maybe Leon could even join the prayer team today. Come on, let's seek him and let's let Jesus lead us into the hard things that he has for us. Come on, church. Here we go.